welcome everybody to this session on the business of ending slavery. I think I probably stole the title from somebody. Um, might have even been you, Matt Friedman. Um, so uh, my name is Carolyn Kitto. I'm with Be Slavery Free. And we're delighted this afternoon to have some some really lead learners and uh, practitioners in this area of how business can engage. So Martin Money is from Ethics Base and he'll be talking about um, how uh, businesses are working on these sorts of issues. We'll then have um, Sam and Mindy from, um, from Regenesis who've been working in the Philippines and about to start working in Nepal on um, how they're working with uh, people at risk. Um, Lisa Lancaster from Outline Denim. Um, uh, we like Lisa almost as much as the most famous, well, more than the most famous wearer of their jeans, who was <laughs> Megan Markle. Um, and Matt Friedman. Matt is a long time um, advocate campaigner, activist in this area. We love working with Matt and he'll be helping us to understand how business and NGOs need to work together. Now I'm going to try and do the thing of sharing my screen and I hope that actually works properly because I'm going to talk about, no, it's not doing it for me. Okay, let's swap screens. Oh, don't you hate it when it stops working? Okay. Just to also say, while I'm trying to double task and do two things at once, um, that uh, what... Oh, it hasn't come up. Oh, it's such a beautiful presentation too. Um, anyhow, um, <laughs> I, I can do it by the fly. Um, uh, we'll be asking questions in between each person and also have Q&A at the end. So please feel free to put your questions in the chat. So my PowerPoint that doesn't want to show up, um, which I will try to share once more, Ah, here it is. It seems to have arrived. Okay. Can you see that? Yes? Yep. Okay, good. All right. So why is it important for business to have a role in addressing modern slavery? Well, one of the key reasons is that there's been such a shift in the last few decades around um, the, the situation of business in terms of revenue and position in the society. Now, I don't want you to take this particular chart in and process it all. However, what I want you to see is that the black um, names that are up there are countries and the red names are businesses. So what we can see is that of the, <coughs> and these figures are from the World Bank, um, of the top 10 countries in the world, uh, 10, 10 uh, revenues in the world, nine are businesses and one, nine are countries and one is a business. So Walmart has the 10th largest economy in the world. And if we actually look through this list, you can see there's way more reds than, than there are um, then there are blacks. And in fact, depending on whose figures you look at, around 78 of the largest economies in the world are actually now businesses. So businesses have far more impact in terms of uh, what happens and regulating, or they can, what happens. So here's a little bit, um, again, I'm not going to go through all of these, but Apple's revenue, um, is, is higher than Portugal's GDP. Um, Netflix has a greater revenue than Malta. Volkswagen is bigger than Chile. Uh, and on and on the list goes. Now, some people would say, and I'll put this as just a little footnote, if these companies actually paid sufficient um, taxes in these, uh, in these countries, this chart might change. However, 
The um, ABC Finance has analysed um, the market cap of the world's most profitable companies and given them a status in terms of what that would look like if we were assessing their GDP. So um, how does their gross domestic, pro how, how does a company's revenue translate to GDP? And what you can see up here is some of the largest companies in the world. So Facebook has, has the economy here um, of um, Hong Kong. Okay, so here's the list. Here are the wealthy countries. And what you can see, the wealthiest is the US followed by China. And then the 10 top richest companies combined would have the third largest economy in the world. You can see uh, Saudi Aramco there, it's a petroleum company. And then you can see the tech companies coming further down the list. Apple's market, market cap is uh, the equivalent to the GDP of Australia um, and Saudi Aramco has got uh, a GDP worth more than Italy, Brazil, Canada and Russia combined. So when we look at that in terms of modern slavery, and you probably all know these figures, but 40 million people live in slavery globally. Um, 15 million are approximately are victims of forced marriage, 24 million are in forced labour, and 16 million people, it is estimated, are exploited in the private economy. So in other words, if we can work with private economies to help them to address the modern slavery which is in their supply chain, we have ways of looking towards making a significant difference to modern slavery in the world. So I'm now going to um, hand over to Martin. Um, Martin is going to talk you through um, some of the issues and, and things that they see arising as trends with the businesses that they are working with. Um, I think you're able to share screen, Martin. Yep, that's great. And um, Martin is based in Sydney, as I am. We are both in lockdown and have been for four weeks. Um, and uh, he works with a, a business called Ethics Base, and he's the Asia Pacific director of that. So over to you, Martin. And we look forward to hearing from you in terms of uh, what you're learning um, through, uh, through your work of, on sustainability uh, absolutely, and thank you so much for the introduction, Caroline. And I, I think it's um, the statistics that you show, and we see them a lot, but um, it never ever gets any easier to uh, to comprehend. So, um, you know, I, and I totally agree that the business sector can have such a significant impact on eradicating um, modern slavery. Um, so, that, so what I was going to do today, I want to just give the audience just a super quick update in terms of who Ethics Space is, just to provide some context. And I'm going to be talking about the um, just some of the legislation that's impacting on um, some of the economies around the world. And I'm going to talk about some simple steps that I'm seeing organisations taking to tackle their um, you know, the modern slavery and to meet their own obligations. So just, just moving on. So ethics space has been um, around for around 10 years. And when we started, our sole focus was to help organisations eradicate bribery and corruption, particularly in their supply chains. But what we've noticed over the last couple of years is that companies are getting a much more, um, you know, they want a much more holistic approach when it comes to managing supply chain risk. So we took the strategic decision a couple of years ago to be participants of the UN Global Compact. And in doing so, we've actually set out our, um, our solutions around those four key pillars. Um, so if anyone ever wants to know about how we can support uh, their organisations, then please let us know. The, so the, um, the, uh, the modern slavery component fits very nicely within our human rights module. So, um, so when, when we talk about legislation, and, and it, you know, it, what we're seeing is that there is more and more legislation that's coming to the fore. And you know, it's been a little bit late in, the car, in, um, in, in, in arriving, but now that it's happening, we're starting to see different legislators that are providing kind of more um, more teeth to, um, to, to their, their legislation. And therefore, um, we're seeing organizations starting to react in a way that's, that's positive, that's starting to drive that level of change. So I won't go through all of these because I know that we're fairly limited for time. 
Um, but we know that certainly in Canada, in the USA, in, in, um, in the UK, that uh, the act that's been around since 2015 is now, um, is now enhanced. So, you know, there are now mandatory reporting um, requirements, which is very similar to what we have here in, um, here in Australia. So um, the same with the EU, um, you know, they're um, developing a legislative proposal um, by 2021 requiring businesses to carry out due diligence. So that's an, another focus area. And as that continues, we're seeing more and more uh, legislation developing in France, in Germany, um, in Norway, in Finland, Switzerland, the Netherlands, and Brazil. So uh, it, it's coming, and we're seeing this happening, um, you know, and we're reading about this every day. So with that in mind, and bearing in mind the impact that business actually has on eradicating modern slavery and, and addressing you know, what is the scourge on, on society, you know, the, I, I just really want to share some of the, the, um, the steps that we're seeing in terms of organizations wanting to comply. Okay, so I mean, the first step that we're seeing is that, you know, when organizations are embarking upon their uh, managing their obligations, the first thing they need to do is to design and implement a modern slavery framework. And, you know, it, it's interesting because when I talk to, uh, to our clients and to our prospects, now, quite often somebody has been charged with that responsibility. Now, they may not have the experience. They may be maybe head of HR, they might be health and safety, they might be legal counsel, but it doesn't matter what position they're in. Now, we always recommend that they get a task force together. They get a broader group together in a room and then start to determine what's really important in terms of designing that framework. So some of the things that, that, that these uh, organizations will talk about is a and they, they talk about educating the business. And this is from the board right the way through the organization. So it's just letting them know, you know what, what this subject is, what the impact is, and what they need to do to help address some of those risks. Um, we always say that you, know, you, sh you should invest in the program. And, and quite often we do see some organizations, unfortunately, that, that, that play lip service to it. They don't want to get behind it. They don't want to spend money. They just want to tick the box. And, um, but we, we believe that if you're going to build a program that's going to make a difference, then it does need that level of investment. And it needs that level of support um, from the board through senior leadership throughout the organization. Um, then they start to talk about policies. It, and, you know, again, policies is, um, is, is an area whereby you know, organizations are, are trying to map out what they believe in through a document. And, and so they start to work on policies that really reflect their, um, their, um, their risk appetite um, and their approach to addressing the problem. And then they start to talk about contract clauses. And you know, so when they are onboarding new suppliers, you now what do they want those suppliers to sign up to? Um, and you know, how, how are they going to, um, you know, what, what legislation or what, what actions are they going to take to make sure that those organizations adhere to it? And what we're also seeing actually is that organizations are now implementing a whistleblower hotline. So they're saying, well, look, if you see something that you don't think is right, here, here is the mechanism in multiple languages to actually do something about it. So that's, that's what we see as step one around designing the, um, the, the framework. I think the next thing is, is really about understanding more about your suppliers. And uh, you know, I'm sure Matt and others are gonna talk about the supply chain and going down to various, various tiers. Um, but I think it's really about trying to understand what, what, what the risk is within, within your supply chain. And, uh, and you can do that through various assessment tools. And we've got one ourselves that was developed by Norton Rose Fulbright, which is a global top 10 law firm. Um, you know, treat treat um, the process as an end-to-end -end communication plan. And, and what I mean by that is that in sending out a questionnaire, you can't just say, that's it, we've done our bit. It's more about you know, how do you actually communicate that with your suppliers? And what, what kind of communication plans do you have in place? And, and what does success look like? What sort of response rates do we want? And, and what if we find risk? What are we going to do about it? And I think the other thing that we're seeing a lot more of is... is um, so, you know, those, those good organizations working collaboratively with their suppliers. You know, it, it, and it, they, they, they start to take on a different um, level of relationship. It's not just that vendor kind of company relationship anymore. It's more about, okay, we're in this together. What do we need to do? What do we need to fix? How can we support you? So I think step two is all about trying to understand your supply chain in a little bit more detail. 
In terms of what we see in step three, and this is about implementing remediation me measures. So this is when you've, you've built your framework, you've, you've tried to understand your supply chain better. And as a consequence of that, you found risk. So, you know, what, what, what do you do? And, and again, you know, when I talk to companies, they say, well, look, you know, we, we're, we're high risk because of where we do business. But we have made that strategic decision to do that. But it doesn't necessarily mean that we, we're doing the wrong thing. So, you know, quite often what they'll have is some very, um, um, you know, very sophisticated policies, systems and controls in place to manage that risk. So, you know, what we would say to our, to our you know, clients and, uh, and you know, what we're hearing is that once you've identified risk, it's think, think about what further due diligence can you take? Um, and that could be, you know, requesting additional evidence, asking for policies, looking for statements that they've made, commitments that they've made. Um, and then, of course, there's the opportunity, albeit it's a little bit more difficult now with COVID, for site visits and audits. But again, it, there is always some risk associated with that because, you know, if there is a planned audit, it's more likely that there's going to be a lot of preparation on their side. And you're not necessarily going to see what, what truly is going on in, in a factory in, uh, in, um, in, a, in an emerging country. Um, so, so, um, so, so in terms of the next step, and this is really about monitoring and reviewing the effectiveness of the program. And I think this is, this is the key really, because once you've done your baseline assessment on your suppliers, you probably want to know, well, actually, what are we doing that's improving that? How are we lifting the bar? And so it's a good opportunity to review what's working. Is our onboarding process um, strong enough? You know, are we doing enough due diligence? Are we actually checking? Um, and are we improving the way in which our suppliers are working with their suppliers and working with their staff and so on? So I think it's about kind of reviewing what, what's working. It's about understanding the gaps as well. And, and, and again, the, the good companies that we talk to are very open and honest in their dialogue. It's like, well, yes, we, we, we have a problem, but we, 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 we need to know how to deal with it. And this is the approach that we're gonna take in order to work uh, through that problem. And we're also seeing those good companies collaborating with others in, in the same industry. You know, it's, it's suddenly it's like, well, are you, are, you, are you seeing the same problems as we're seeing? And what are you doing about it? And this becomes, you know, so suddenly the power of these organizations starts to increase and, um, and, and you know, it becomes the solution as opposed to trying to solve the problem in isolation. And then I think it's about measuring tangible improvements. And again, you know, through either through um, your, supply, your supply chain surveys or different risk assessment tools that you can use, if you're benchmarking one year against the next, then suddenly you can start to measure those tangible improvements and then you can start to celebrate those report them through the board and through other other documentation so um so that's that's the, the kind of process that you see so i think that after that it's really about you know um it's about establishing appropriate mechanisms for internal and external reporting and, uh, and again when i talk about the australian Commonwealth Modern Slavery Act, um, you know, there is a reporting obligation. And within that reporting obligation, you, you, as, a, as an entity that's um, that with revenues greater than 100 million Australian dollars, you are compelled to submit your modern slavery statement. But not only have you got to submit your modern slavery statement, but that modern slavery statement has to be fit for purpose for the type of organization you are. So, so it's, so what we, again, what we're seeing is that some organizations that take it very seriously put a lot of emphasis on their statement. They put a lot of emphasis in their, in their research, in their risk assessment, in their strategy, in their policies. Others will just submit maybe a two or three page document that looks incredibly generic in nature. And you can see that they aren't necessarily taking it as seriously as they could. So in essence, you know, that's what we're seeing in terms of those, those five steps. And uh, um, so I'm hoping but that covers what you wanted me to cover, Kitty, and uh, I'm open for questions if any have come through on the chat box. Great. Uh, thank you so much, Martin. Really appreciate your input there. Um, I have a thing going on with my... Um, with my camera that it keeps on sending me blurry, but I'm not gonna stay on for very long. Uh, there aren't any uh, chats that are actually there. So I just wanna introduce um, um, Sam and Mindy who are with Regenesis. So Sam and Mindy, um, I, I, I don't think that Sam's been, uh, Mindy's been to um, 
to Arap, but Sam certainly has and has presented previously. He's he's part of our, our family and our network. Um, and they are working in the Philippines on a model of business um, that works with survivors. And uh, they're going to tell you a bit about that. They're about to start working in Nepal. So over to you, Sam and Mindy. And um, we look forward to hearing about your your work and your model and what you're learning about that. Thanks, Caroline. Uh, okay, so, uh, so we've been doing this for the last eight years um, in terms of running um, the company Regenesis BPO. So we are a business process outsourcing company, um, but to most people, um, that's basically uh, your standard outsourcing, but the area that we specialize is, uh, is in digital image processing. Um, so if you can think about your uh, real estate photos that come back uh, looking very nice and touched up, uh, basically that's that's one of the things that we do. Uh, we also do uh, video editing and, um, and also we're moving more and more into the 3D market. Um, so we process about a million photos a year. Uh, each photo takes anywhere between five minutes to 10, 15 minutes to edit. Uh, and uh, we have a workforce of about 250 based in uh, Cebu, Philippines, uh, doing that work. Now, out of that 250, uh, there are about 200 uh, that are from our target demographic, and 60% uh, of those come from a background where there's been um, exploitation and violence, right? Um, so, you know, when we talk about slavery, right, uh, individuals from that category uh, fall into that group, right? So we're talking about 120 people. And really, you know, what we've done is to create a workplace that uh, the work and the working conditions designed specifically to help survivors recover, right? Um, I think one of the questions that we had to grapple with at the start was whether or not we would pursue a for-profit model or not-for-profit model. Um, and, you know, for people who are interested in setting up freedom businesses, um, you know, you can take advantage of our learnings, which was, you know, we ended up with a for-profit model. Um, the reason being, you know, several reasons, but, uh, you know, the easy one to think about is obviously sustainability, right? On one hand, you're not dependent on others for handouts and you can create your own uh, stream of business. The challenge with that is finding customers. Uh, but uh, I also believe the for-profit model creates the right incentive. Um, so I've met, you know, many dedicated leaders in the not-for-profit sector, but the stakes of doing a good job uh, as an owner of a business is different if you have bought your life savings uh, or put in a substantial investment. Uh, into it, right? Um, and certainly, you know, uh, in our journey, um, I can think of you know, the second year, two year mark where things got really tough and uh, we would have been, you know, it would have been easy to stop doing what we did, right? But we had already sunk too much money into it at that stage. A um, uh, couple of other things, right? The for profit model makes you look for higher value services and products, right? which then requires uh, more training and investment in our staff. Um, so that means that we can also give them greater salaries and a proper career path. And then finally, uh, the for-profit model forces you to create the goods and services that are valued in the market, right? So that this means that you need to produce not just good quality goods, but also with the productivity and efficiency that's uh, equal to or beats the competitors. Um, so I think Mindy, yeah. Yeah, so I would also add, um, so Sam's kind of focused on why being for profit is good for business, but um, I, I have I'm a background, my background is as a physician and a public health practitioner, and I look at the human development side, and my argument would be that it's also uh, in the best interest of the survivor population, because obviously to offer um, high quality, efficient services into a competitive market. You need a very high performing um, employee population. And of course, survivors don't come necessarily or actually rarely they do. They come with the technical 
um, professional and, and life skills to initially be uh, high performing. But of course, they are very capable of um, acquiring those skills. So that it means that as a business, we need to be very intentional and rigorous. Um, and I want to say evidence-based, but there's very little research um, to guide our practice at the moment. So we need to be innovative um, in the work culture and the um, and with the programs and services um, that we offer. So to really drive their recovery and enable them to, to acquire the professional and the, the personal or life skills that they need to be uh, successful. So again, doing so really drives their recoveries and, and enables them um, to, you know, to live the life that, that they would like. Um, yeah. And yeah, um, you know, I think uh, you know people have asked us uh, uh, quite often during uh, the last conference, uh, the last ERAD conference, in terms of you know, um, if one was interested in starting a uh, freedom business, uh, you know, what tips do we have? And you know, firstly, uh, we would start off with. Uh, or I would suggest that they understand what's involved in running a business, right? Um, so uh, in terms of all of the juggling that needs to, uh, needs to happen, uh, everything from sales to operations to finance, right? Um, so I would encourage, you know, uh, people to look at business models, but actually not only uh, look at the business models, but also actually to work in a business, even as an employee, right, to get that uh, real grounding in that. And then the other one is around finding mentors and guides and following their guidance. Uh, there are quite a few good accelerator programs for social enterprises now and uh, a good body of knowledge uh, uh, at present about starting a business in this area. Uh, there certainly wasn't much when we started, but uh, thankfully, um, you know, the quality of support that's out there is significant and good. Um, yeah, I mean, again, as Sam said, when we started seven and a half years ago, we were very much on our own um, with limited support. And we, um, you know, must, we tapped whatever resources and advice there was at the time. Um, but again, that was quite um, limited. So we had to learn a lot and have a very active uh, intentional learning process and that involved making you know a lot, a lot of mistakes and um, failing in different areas and, and again we continue to learn and grow ourselves through this process so um, you know take the advantage of other people's experiences there, there's now um, we were very thankful to be involved in an umbrella organization called Freedom Business Alliance and their, their goal is really to support businesses like ours and they do a very good job and they're in the process of developing frameworks and, and guidelines to, to support businesses. So I definitely suggest um, reaching out and, and getting involved with them even before you start. Um, yeah, so one other question uh, that we that is worth answering, I guess, is um, how, how a business uh, contributes uh, to um, the goal of, you know, not only the goal, I guess there's dual goals, there's business goals and there's goals in terms of social impact. Um, so, but how do we contribute to the, to the, the goal of survivor recovery and, and reintegration? Um, you know, and early on, um, Sam used to say that um, as a business, we, we do the last mile of, of restoration and, and recovery. Um, but I think over, over time um, and with our research, we've seen that we're actually doing far more than that. Um, when, when our um, trainees enter into our program, um, they're still very vulnerable. Um, when we, we look at their um, mental health scores, um, over 40% still have active PTSD symptoms and, and many also have anxiety and depression um, when they enter the workplace. Uh, and interestingly, if you look at global research, um, that those prevalences are very similar to those that you see um, in, in survivors immediately exiting um, exploitation and entering aftercare. And so we, we, we get um, that we receive them perhaps 
um, on average about four and a half years after you know that amount of time in residential aftercare and we're seeing similar prevalence and and they're often discharged back into very uh, challenging social situations so they have a lot of mental health and and psychosocial issues um, when they they enter the workplace together with a lack of, of professional and and technical skills so uh, we really again have to invest um, a lot um, and um, and we also know that um, you know from from a work perspective that this is really the survivor's first priority really just because they exit aftercare doesn't oh, it's not exit aftercare or they exit ex, the exploitative situation um, does not mean that 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 need to provide for their families disappear it's still there and it, it remains their priority and it's very hard for them to recover if that need for decent um, employment and a living wage isn't isn't met and then of course it makes them vulnerable to re-exploitation and and we know that you know the the data there is that you know 50 percent of survivors end up um, in situations of re-exploitation so it's both for prevention and and recovery um, so again we we have layers of different services and support that we offer within um, within the workplace and we, we also do research. So we look at um, recovery, I guess, multi-dimensionally. Multi um, and for example, with PTSD, we see their scores reduce uh, quite significantly in the first 12 months. Um, most of them will return to normal levels. Um, and we see other changes that occur, you know, in sort of the medium, you know, to longer term part of their their journey and it's certainly complex. Um, the journey is complex and, and and often quite circuitous, but of course they're survivors of, of complex trauma and, and we expect that. But the workplace and you know provides because it's sustainable, it enables us to provide the care that they need over the longer term so that they can go through those various stages of recovery um, whilst providing for themselves um, and their family. Um, so, I mean, I think that um, the workplace is an ideal, if not the ideal, uh, opportunity for, um, for recovery um, for this population. Um, partly because if you think of some of the determinants of, say, developing resilience, um, of um, recovering from anxiety and PTSD, is that you need exposure to stress, you need exposure to challenges, um, to be able to develop more healthier coping mechanisms, um, to be able to challenge some of your perceptions about the world, to be able to, um, to, be able to have opportunities even to fail and to be able to process that in a healthy way and, and start again, which is what resilience is. And, and you need the right level of challenge in the workplace. So, and we believe with digital image processing for our population that that provides a really good level of challenge. They start off editing five photos a day and then perhaps get up to 60 photos with 97% quality after three or four months. And, and it, it's not only the right level of challenge to help them develop good coping mechanisms and resilience, it, it's enough that um, they see their own growth and, and they become surprised by their achievement and, and their mastery over this. And that, that again drives you know, changes in their self-esteem and self-confidence. Um, and identity and, and our research shows that, that that evolution of their identity and, and aspirations is one of the key drivers of, um, of their overall recovery. And um, this, I think there's a few other opportunities um, available to them that, that enables that, that um, type of post-traumatic growth. So yeah, um, again, as a physician, you would expect me perhaps to focus on other settings uh, to, to recommend for recovery, but I'm really convinced that the workplace has such a big role in that regard. Thank you, Caroline. Great, thank you so much, Sam and Mindy. And um, there is a question here. I, I suspect that you've probably answered it, but you might want to just give a short answer. And and I think part of the answer is that the two of you actually embody this answer. So we have a business person and a physician. Um, so the question is, um, how do you balance providing supportive training and employee environment with the need to produce high quality and efficient work? 
Yeah. 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 It's it's <laughs> difficult, right? But you know, my catchphrase is that um, we don't reduce our um, we don't lower our performance and behavioural expectations. We maintain them and they're constant. What we do is we increase or we tailor the level of support to our population <laughs> to enable them to be successful. So that, that is a constant um, in terms of what we aim to output. We just, we just have to work with the support services and programs we offer to capacitate our, our population to meet those. Um, and on a day-to-day -day basis, of course, there's a lot of struggle, um, you know, and challenges to do that. It's it's difficult and stressful work. That that's for sure. So in practice, it, it is it, it is hard, but I think uh, we do we do achieve that balance in the end. Mm. Okay, and and one more question. Um, Somebody said, uh, Brian says, I see from your website that you use a survivor story and the demographics of your employees on your impact pages. So as a for-profit company, um, how do you balance using survivor stories to market your business with the stigmatisation that that might create for survivors? Yep. Yeah, so um, in terms of survivor stories, um, really, you know, uh, we don't use it uh, in terms of our actual marketing, right? So it's in our website uh, as far as uh, informing our customers and potential customers that they are working with a uh, ethical company in terms of ethical business practices. And, you know, it's, it's, um, uh, when we go to a pitch with our customers, we start off with the high quality of our service, right? And consistent delivery, right? Um, coming in with, I suppose, the social impact story rarely makes a difference in the business decision whether or not to uh, use us, uh, use our services, right? So, you know, for example, we work at one of the largest 3D technology companies in the world, right? and um, they knew about a bit about our social impact that just opened the door uh, but every conversation subsequently has been around our technical delivery and capability right mm -hmm. so um, again we're very mindful about uh, using the stories and in fact you know uh, one of our customers they get a lot of value uh, from talking about these stories internally within their own company Right, so Mindy, I think you might have something to add. <laughs> okay, but yeah, so um, again, um, you know, when, when we spoke to, you know, mentors and business experts and, you know, CEOs and business owners, uh, they basically said, look, put the story out there because what we do is unique enough uh, to differentiate us in a good way in the market, right? But at the same time, we had to respect privacy and security. Uh, and hence, you know, uh, we're really careful about, you know, the number of stories and the people in the stories that we profile, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, we have people going through court cases, et cetera, right? Uh, and if you can imagine, you know, we have about you know, 120 stories uh, within our company, so to speak, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, we only have mm -hmm. a handful that's out there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think in short, we don't use it to market. It's just an add-on for our, our business partners. Yeah. Mm. yeah. And, and certainly um, what I can say, uh, Sam and, and Mindy, is that I've re I haven't been responsible for helping them grow their business, but I have referred to a few people and, uh, and those people are utterly satisfied with the service that they get. And, yes, it was yeah. a nice little... Um, it was a nice little add-on, um, but um, but uh, that that there was this ethical work being done. Some of these are businesses that are needing to trace their supply chains as part of the Modern Slavery Act, and um, and they actually loved that they were also being able to contributing. Um, so uh, so that's that's um, that's been really positive. People have continued and have promoted their work because of the good work that's done. And uh, yeah, that's that's excellent. Okay, we're going to have to move on. Um, and uh, thank you, Sam. Thank you, Mindy.
be it's it's great to hear both sides of your story. So thank you. Thanks, Caroline. Um, no worries. Our next our next person to give input is Liesl, and Liesl is from um, is from Outland Denim. So Outland Denim is uh, based in uh, Cambodia and uh, for their factories. They also, and she'll talk a bit more about their supply chain because they're sourcing from Turkey and a range of different places that have modern slavery issues. And so uh, she's going to also talk about the kind of model that Outland Denim uses, which they call their freedom cycle. So over to you, Liesl. Oh, thank you for the introduction. And I love being able to learn from the other speakers as well and just um, hear the knowledge that they've gleaned over their years. So thank you, guys. Um, I'll just start off with, uh, I guess, Outland Denim has been on a journey for over 10 years now of, of developing this model. And um, we really felt that uh, employment and in our situation, denim jeans could be a vehicle to really create some some powerful change. Um, initially, the founder began, we actually set up as a not-for-profit in the early years um, and did funding from donations and fundraisers and we did everything we could to raise money. I came along roughly eight years ago and started working alongside James, the founder. Um, he had a welding business, which was also helping to fund the not-for-profit. Um, the, the denim project, as we called it, um, out really outgrew the ability of, of this sort of secondary welding business to continue to, to fund it. Um, the type of scale and impact we dreamed of having, uh, we, we couldn't quite see the way forward um, with the not-for-profit model that we'd originally started with. We didn't have the cash flows to get the product to the quality it needed to be. Um, and the vision was to employ far more than the um, handful of, of women that we'd worked with um, in those early years. And it still is to employ, employ far more than we currently have. But um, the, the dream is really to create as, as many employment opportunities as possible. We've got our cut and sew facility set up where we're producing denim jeans and other products now um, in a province in Cambodia uh, and a wash and finishing facility as well. We um, have initially, we started with working with um, survivors of exploitation and over the years, the doors have opened much wider. We've got people from various backgrounds. Uh, some have come to us more with a physical disability as the reason they were struggling to get work in the garment industry or with their own businesses, um, but also uh, people that have come from more sort of normal family structures as well. Um, so we've got a, a range of different um, employees, different skill levels, different backgrounds, but that's been um, an incredible part of, of the journey of the business. And um, the different skill levels have definitely been an asset as we've watched sort of others train each other up and develop those skills and, and lift the quality that was needed as well. Um, so we ended up changing our model. So we decided to, to raise capital and take on a for-profit model to be able to scale the impact we wanted to have to, to bring in the, the fabrics and to um, raise the quality level that we knew was needed for, for the market. Um, uh, I was chatting with James, the founder, a bit about his, his decision around that move. And he was saying, if you link investor dollars with impact, that's far more scalable and attractive to the everyday person. Um, I can give, the person can give while having a genuine impact investment with a potential of a healthy return. So that was some of the thinking behind, behind that move. Um, from there, we really built a business plan that reflected a for-profit model. We focused a lot on marketing insights, research trends, consumer behaviors, where the market was going, proof of concept on a social level, which we'd had um, proof of through the years of operating as a not-for-profit. Um, until we had the confidence we had something really powerful and also that had commercial value and we started to pitch to um, investors from there. So that's a bit of our, our journey in becoming a, a for-profit model. Um, so our cut and sew facilities, which are often known in the supply chain world as that first tier, um, we have beautiful relationship with, we're in connection with daily. Often our, our Aussie team are in Cambodia, working alongside our Cambodian team. Um, with the restrictions of COVID, the local team have been flying along with, um, if they need any support from us in Oz, we're here, but they've been doing an amazing job um, on the ground in Cambodia with the team there. Um, in the fashion world, tiers are often 
uh, referred to as various levels of the supply chain. So supply chains are so complex and deep. Um, for, for us as a denim brand, that first you might get a cut and sew facility, but then you have your, your mills, your fabric mills, and then there's each level as well that those raw materials have gone through to make it into that final product. Um, so a lot of brands do invest a lot of time in understanding um, that, that first tier and understanding the standards, how people are cared for in that first tier. Uh, because we've been able to set that first tier up ourselves, we've been able to really prioritise um, setting up, I guess you'd say, um, pillars that we feel are part of what's needed to be part of a cycle of freedom and bringing tools around people. We definitely aren't the answer, but we can bring tools around the people that we employ um, and see them really create some amazing change in, in their lives and in their families and communities as well. Um, so we've, we've got four pillars that we usually think of when we think of the social impact side of Outland Denim. And the first is opportunity. And so having opportunity for someone who perhaps has not had any sewing experience before and is looking for work. Um, often we have uh, an NGO partner refer a client that they know is looking for work in the area that we're based in. And we'll start the journey of um, training and employment and upskilling from there. Um, but also, so training is another pillar there, but also um, a living wage is important and not just being paid properly, but also understanding how to budget and save if that's knowledge that's needed. So um, education has been a huge part of the model for us and incorporating that with that question earlier, I thought it is a challenge sometimes incorporating um, education and these sort of above and beyond approaches into also producing genes and being efficient and having the quality. Um, so we've been working on that and how to implement that, but we've been really passionate to share about um, uh, Kamai Literacy, a lot of the employees that have come to us have had to drop out of school quite early um, due to financial pressures on the family. Um, the, the financial management is mentioned, budgeting and planning and saving for the future. Uh, health is probably the, the most requested topic we get. We often um, hearing from the employees of, of what they would love to learn about next and um, health is the most commonly asked for topic. So a lot of our trainings around women's health, children's health uh, and various health topics. Uh, and then also um, using the support of NGO partners, doing education on what is trafficking and what are the signs of it? And what do you do if you think, you know, somebody who might be in trouble? Um, and really the models always being tweaked and developed as we learn more from the staff and from people that have been on the ground and working longer than we have um, and just trying to be adaptable and, and really willing to listen and learn as, as we grow and um, improve the way we've sort of been doing things. But um, with the supply chain, obviously this first two have got this amazing relationship with, but it is really hard to see into those tiers deeper down. And so, for Outland Denim, we were looking across the supply chain and we felt the area of greatest risk for us as a brand would likely be the level furthest from our reach as a brand also, which is um, the organic cotton farms where the cotton's being grown. And um, we, we call that tier four at Outland. And these organic cotton farms often have seasonal migrant worker communities um, coming to work them. And so this is a, a level that we're quite far removed from. There's um, quite a number of supply chain partners in between us and the farm. Uh, but we felt that we should, instead of going from a top-down approach, which is, which is a bit more typical, we felt to really be part of actively looking for the issues and assuming that they're there rather than hoping that they're not there. Um, we need to start getting to that, that ground level and then working our way back up. So we started um, a, a pilot actually a bit over 12 months ago now, where we started to uh, build this campaign of how to communicate with um, the target demographic that we felt would be most vulnerable and often part of that seasonal and migrant worker community on the organic cotton farms. And we were blown away by um, the engagement and reach that this program had. So we were able to not just communicate on um, topics such as human rights and how to obtain visas and um, COVID-19 safety, uh, how to access health support, but also hear back um, from this community about the situation and what it was like for them um, doing the seasonal migrant work in the agricultural sector. Um, and then gathering this data and information to then be able to take it to others that are also sharing the supply chain. Um, there's many brands around the world sharing similar suppliers and similar supply chains and similar cotton farms. 
And so we started to chat to others and say, would you be willing to join with us and look into these issues and then start to be part of resolving them with us and with the other supply chain partners as well. Um, so we've been able to release a lot of educational videos in local language and also in the language of, of the migrant community um, and had yeah, a, an amazing number of, of views on the clips and also communications between the, the workers and ourselves. So that's been a huge step. And the next step for us is really um, inviting other brands to, to join in as well, um, to be able to collaborate, have more leverage, more impact and share the cost and scale the the impact it could really have um, in also chatting with suppliers. It's amazing to have other brands with a similar um, interest and a similar desire to be part of the solution rather than part of the issue. So that's been a big part of our supply chain journey. Um, I'm constantly following fibers to see where they've originated from. And that's, um, that's a big part of the role. But uh, I love another part of the role I just want to mention was um, the NGO partnerships we've built. Um, as I mentioned, in Cambodia, where our facilities are, that's often how um, some of our employees are referred to us through those relationships. And the support workers or counsellors that are connected with the client of the NGO and then um, in time to come, our employee, stay connected. And we think that's so important as they continue to follow and journey along with that person because um, that relationship's there. They understand the full background and the story of this person. And so we, we make space and time for them to be able to meet and check in and just counsel and support um, along the journey. So we've been so thankful for those relationships and there's amazing expertise that the NGO community have had that we certainly haven't had. So we had to learn from each other and invite them into our facilities to help train and skill as well. The impact of just even human trafficking training alone, we've watched employees um, start cases to look for relatives and see those relatives um, reunited back again with family members. And so just the power of that information and its ripple effect in community has been um, really amazing to watch. All right, I think I've probably gone a bit over time. Sorry, Karen. <laughs> That's fine. That's fine. That was so, um, so helpful to hear that range. And we know that, um, you know, working on the business and on the on the survivor side um, creates a complexity and it's probably hard to cover both of them in 12 minutes that I gave you. Um, so thank you so much. That was great, Liesl. Um, our next speaker is, is Matt Friedman. Um, Matt is um, legendary in his persistence to, um, to help us uh, to see the importance of the private sector in addressing modern slavery and also to, um, to, to come with strategies that we can join things up. And he's going to tell us a little bit about his vision for that. So over to you, Matt. Very good. Thank you, Carolyn, and thank you for this opportunity. You know, I can't begin my presentation without going back to the numbers. 40 million people in modern slavery, 25 million of them in forced labor, 16 million of them associated with supply chains. And here in Asia, about 62% of what we call people in modern slavery are found in our backyard or in our neighborhoods and so forth. A couple of other interesting uh, statistics. It's estimated there's 9.2 million people entering per year, 25,200 per day or new slave every four seconds. When it comes to kind of the problem uh, over the last uh, 20, 25 years that I've been working on, we would see a lot of kind of emphasis on the fishing industry and in sweatshops and so, uh, so forth. But the interesting thing about human trafficking is that when you start shining a light in different directions, you begin to see that there are many other areas that have issues. We've seen it in construction, we've seen it in agriculture. Recently, a number of tech companies have come forward and talked about how they are facing issues related to modern slavery. As well as recently, we worked with a pharmaceutical company uh, that identified that their third party delivery trucks and individuals were associated with modern slavery. And the story goes on and on. If people can take advantage of other people, they're gonna do so. And so as we continue to unfold the various levels of this issue, we are going to see more and more different types of human trafficking. When it comes to COVID, uh, we're seeing a devastating impact here in this part of the world. 
partly because what we have is a situation whereby, you know, people are sent home, the factories are closed, they don't have any savings, they borrow money, and that is a perfect recipe for somebody to be tricked and deceived and forced into a situation where the person who owns that debt comes and says, well, I need a family member for a year to work in this factory to pay this off. Often these debts are compounded uh, in a fraudulent, Ill illegal way, but nevertheless, it's a real problem. Why am I telling you all of this? Well, because of this. You know, when it comes to all the NGOs, the governments and the United Nations and the private sector, everybody coming forward, the number of documented cases per year related to the number of people that are helped usually ranges around 100,000. So if we're talking about 40 million people in modern slavery and uh, we're only helping about 100,000, that comes out to about 0.2% of the victims, not even a half percent. What you see there is the blue, which represents the people that we have documented helped. The red represents the ones we haven't. When you look at this, you might ask the question, does the counter-trafficking world not care? We're not working hard enough? That's not the issue. The issue is this. The amount of money generated from modern slavery is excessive, 150 billion US dollars a year. The amount of money that's used globally to address this is somewhere around 350 million or 0.23%. So we have this huge amount of profit. You're working with individuals who don't have to follow rules and regulations. Those of you who are NGO people like myself, we do have to follow rules and regulations. We have to get approvals. We have to move things forward in a systematic way. You can see what it is that we're up against. Another thing that we're facing is a situation where a lot of people just simply don't know about this topic. I do a lot of presentations. I get in front of a lot of audiences. I talk about this and I always have a large percentage of people come and say, wow, I heard about modern slavery. Didn't really understand what it was. Now that I do, I recognize that I need to learn a lot more. Okay, so how does this relate to the private sector? When governments came to realize that you had a situation whereby the collective actions of the governments, the NGOs, the United Nations weren't having even 1% impact. Uh, they felt like, well, we need to get the private sector involved. Why? Because many of what were the people who are in these situations are associated with supply chains and that's where the private sector works. So as we heard, Martin talked a little bit about the laws. And what we've been seeing is that the laws since 2012 have progressively gotten more and more strict. Initially, it was the California Transparency and Supply Chain Act. It basically said, if you have any products in California and you're a big company, you gotta put on your website what you're doing to address modern slavery. If you're not doing anything at all and you say that, you're in compliance, but you have to say something. This allows consumers to look at what companies are doing or not doing. And then we saw the UK Modern Slavery Act, which ad added a few additional things. Uh, for example, it had to uh, have an annual report, has to be signed by the board of directors, Australia added more, and we're seeing Germany, Canada, perhaps even New Zealand, when they eventually come up with their legislation will add potentially fines and penalties. We're seeing lawsuits against major companies. For example, major retailers that buy uh, seafood from Thailand, some of them have been sued. Uh, organizations that buy cocoa have been sued. We've seen other examples. This creates a reputational risk for the organization. It's a real business risk. And so that's why companies have to be concerned about this. Media coverage related to this topic has almost doubled every year for the past five years. And so people are interested in the topic and they wanna know whether or not the companies they're buying from have any association with modern slavery. And lastly, ESG, which is the uh, SDG for the private sector, which looks at environmental indicators, social indicators, and governance indicators, uh, the investment companies are getting a lot of pressure from investors and people who have mutual funds or retirement funds. They want to know whether or not the companies that are in those portfolios are doing the right thing when it comes to modern slavery. So as a result of that, we see a significant increase in the number of uh, organizations that are beginning to measure these things. All of these things basically translate to a situation where the private sector has to get more involved. Another thing that we uh, are seeing is studies that show the reality of what companies are facing, manufacturers, retailers, when it comes to their supply chains. One study in the UK said that 72% of supply chain professionals admit to having no visibility in their supply chain before below the first tier. I'll talk about that in a second. Another one said 78% of business leaders believe modern slavery already exists in their supply chain. 
So what we're talking about here is not a hypothetical situation. It's a real situation that companies have to address. So what do we mean by uh, tiers? An average company, let's say it's a running shoe, would have maybe a three-tier supply chain. Tier one is where you actually assemble the running shoe, where you take the component parts and put it together. Tier two is where you get the shoelaces and the rivets and the zippers and the various other components. And tier three is generally where the raw material comes from. So for years, companies have been uh, auditing tier one. For the last 25 years, you hardly find issues at that level. But tier two and three, many of them have never had as an expectation that they have to look at these various levels. But with the legislation and with the push, many organizations now realize they have to move in the direction of doing this. Now, this is a conundrum for companies. Maybe they were uh, auditing 1,400 factors that were tier one. If you add tier two and three, maybe it gets up to 5,000. Who's going to pay for that? Is it going to be the consumer? So there's a lot of reckoning that has to be done. And what we're beginning to see in some cases is companies coming together and basically uh, sharing audit information to get around that. Okay, so what are the issues that we're uh, seeing? There's probably 25 of them. I'm only going to go through a couple of them. Probably the biggest one we see in Southeast Asia is recruitment fees. A guy in Nepal making 30 US dollars a month, agent comes in, says to him, how would you like to make $200 uh, a month? Uh, we're going to send you to Malaysia. You can get a lot more money. I says, great. What do I need to do? Well, you got to put up $1,500. Well, I don't have $1,500. Don't worry about it. We'll lend you the money. We'll work out the arrangements. We'll uh, get you all taken care of, get your passport, send you to Malaysia. What the person doesn't realize is that that $1,500 has interest and additional <laughs> fees. And eventually, by the time he or she gets to Malaysia, that could be $3,000, $4,000. And they up, end up working for years basically to pay back that capital. Another thing we see is contract substitution. We have a person who signs a contract in Nepalese, reads it, understands it, but when he gets to Malaysia, he has to sign another one in Malay. I don't speak Malay. You have to sign it or we're gonna send you back. So this individual signs it. In there are all kinds of fees, penalties, and various other things. Instead of making $200 a month, maybe they're making 50 or $40 a month. When it comes to holding documentation, so what happens is the person arrives there, the passport and all the uh, employment information is taken by the company. If this individual doesn't like the experience and wants to leave, the factory says, well, we're not going to give you back your documentation. And if you don't have it and you go and try to leave the country, you're going to get arrested. So all of these things are basically the types of issues that we're uh, seeing uh, across uh, Asia that are being addressed. So what are the private sector companies doing? Well, a lot of them are, are looking into this and identifying what policies and procedures they will have from the top of the company all the way down to their subcontractors and sub-subcontractors. And a lot of training is being done. For example, the organization that I work with does training of the brands, does training of uh, kind of the factories, the sub factories, and we do it in the language that the people can understand because if you don't know what modern slavery is, you're not going to be able to address it. We're seeing a lot more emphasis on audits and social audits going in and really trying to identify what needs to be done in order to capture the essence of whether or not people are being uh, exploited in any kind of a situation. We're seeing more emphasis on kind of mapping supply chain. So instead of just looking at tier one, looking at tier two, taking a sample of those factories, um, doing audits there to see whether or not issues or problems are uh, arising. You're hearing a lot about responsible recruitment. That basically, uh, a lot of companies have policies that say, we will not work with a factory that has any employees that have debt. And so if they have debt, the factory has to pay for that. And that helps to ensure that there isn't a, a leverage to hold a person in place. And the last thing I'll say is a lot of emphasis on kind of worker feedback, where basically you have a situation where workers uh, have an opportunity to use an app, to use some type of a suggestion box, to be able to get information to NGOs that are working with factories to collect this information to ensure that no exploitation takes place. Now, when it comes to kind of the private sector and the NGO sector, you know, I did a little bit of work in wildlife trafficking for a while. And the interesting thing about this is if you, uh, you know, confiscate a box of turtles, you bring them out to the forest, let them go, not a big deal. 
But when you're dealing with human beings, you're dealing with all kinds of issues. You know, whether people are traumatized, whether people have issues and problems that have to be addressed, you have to get them home, you have to get them home safely, you have to uh, give them some kind of uh, payment for what's happening. So the NGOs would be a perfect uh, kind of match with the private sector. But the issue that we're often facing is the private sector and the NGO sector don't generally really uh, trust each other. We see this all the time. The private sector is afraid that if they talk to the NGOs, information will get out that will name and shame them. The NGOs feel like the private sector basically is use, are, are using their systems and procedures to get profits because they don't really care about people. I've had a lot of contact on both sides. I've been working for the private sector or with the private sector for eight years. I've worked with the NGO sector for over 20 years. And I know that there is room for bridging the gap between these groups, because if we get both working together, that would really make a significant difference. The organization I work with is called the Makeon Club. We work with the private sector in a positive, supportive way. We have an association that has about 50 members, which includes banks, retailers, manufacturers, the hospitality industry. And basically what we do is give them the tools and the means and the apps and the trainings that they need in order to look at their business, find a forced labor circumstances and address it or do whatever they can to prevent it. And with that, I will stop. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Matt. That was um, that was an excellent overview and a great call for us to be working together in this space. Um, so just a reminder, folks, if you want to put questions in the chat, we're very happy to have that. Um, probably the, the first question needs to go to both Liesl and, and Sam and Mindy. Um, and it's a question about what types of work have your employees gone on to um, after they leave your company and has, a has the transition to a business that is not a freedom business um, been successful? So how about Sam and Mindy first? Yeah, okay. Well, um, the way our, I guess, engagement with our employees work is, is if they're going to leave, um, by choice or that they're not being performing adequately in the workplace, we refer them back uh, to the partners that, that referred them initially and they do that follow-up. So we're not engaging, we're intentionally not engaging with them long-term after they leave because that really we're trying to treat them as professionals and maintain normal professional engagement with them. But of course we keep in touch with our referral partners so we do hear back what they're doing and for those that have been able to stay and get two or year, two or three years of BPO experience with us, they're then able to go and work in other uh, BPO companies like call centres or other, you know, data processing type work. So it is a it is an opportunity and a path into another company um, for them. Mm, great. Okay. And Liesl? Yeah. Well, for us. Um, we don't always have a lot of communication ongoing after they've let, uh, left Outland Denim, but I, I know for um, one of our young women who'd started with us um, without sewing skills, she sort of learnt skills and then moved to different departments and learnt um, more of a variety of skills within the same industry. She was able to take a job closer to where one of her relatives lived um, in more of a leadership position. So we were really happy for her to, to go and take that. That was um, more of a section leader position um, in, in a different city. So often it does seem that the choice about where people work is based around family. I'm sure it's similar for, for your team at Regenesis, often based mm -hmm. around family, uh, family commitments, um, more so than necessarily the position. But yeah, we were, we were thrilled to be able to see someone move into a higher position than what they'd had with us at Outland Denim. But the goal is to see people um, cycle through various um, processes at, at our own cut and sew facility and wash facility so that it can be more of an upskilling process so they could get a similar or hopefully even better position elsewhere. Yeah. Great, and okay. Was, sorry, Carolyn, one, one more thing. Uh, so our, our kind of thinking is that, you know, that recovery process is a multi-year journey, right? So um, we, we're not kind of, uh, we haven't designed it so that they churn through and spend only a few months and then move on to something else, right? Um, so we, we are in that 
recovery journey alongside with them for quite a while, right? Um, and uh, what we've done is to create uh, like pretty deep career paths. So they start as an editor, move into the quality control, and then move into successive leadership teams, right? Or specialize and become a product specialist, right? Um, so the aim is that uh, they're, they're with us for a while and uh, once they're confident, they can move on. Mm, great, excellent, excellent, that's great. Um, I love the tailored approach, so yeah. Uh, Matt Friedman has just put his email address up there and just before Priscilla also put up the contact uh, for the Freedom Business Alliance, who uh, we had invited to be part of this webinar, um, both um, Outland Denim and Regenesis are members, um, uh, but they just, it just didn't work out. And particularly the times didn't work out because I think some of their people are, it's 3 a.m. in the morning. Um, so that's the dilemma of running a conference like this. Um, so the next question, I'm going to have a go at answering this and then invite um, Matt uh, and, and probably Martin if they want to add anything. So the question is, how can people or organisations who are at this conference join any efforts to send letters to the business sector to join in against human trafficking? Um, that's one of the key things that uh, Be Slavery Free does. And, um, and also relating to business is one of the key things that the Macon Club does. And we do some of those things in partnership. Our approach to relating to business is what we call a name and fame approach, where uh, we don't seek to say, this is what you're doing wrong. We seek to work with business or business sectors to say, this is where we think together, we need to make some changes. Um, so for example, we produce a COCO scorecard each year. Um, this last year, we had 215 million people on um, print media, um, access that so it has a pretty big reach and probably a third of the companies that we surveyed wrote and thanked us um, so that's the kind of relationship that we're actually working on building and even those that scored badly thanked us because they said we were actually helping them to improve their practices and they appreciated that so that's the kind of approach that we work we'd be happy to help if you want to email us die but Matt do you have anything you want to add to that I'll put my email address in yeah uh, during COVID we reached out to a lot of NGOs across Asia to get a general sense of kind of what they were experiencing whether or not they were finding issues with workers and so forth and when they found out that my organization was working with the private sector there was a lot of questions that they asked you know you're working with the private sector how can you do that do you really trust them are they really doing anything uh, and so we did a, a, a paper where we went and did a little bit more of a systematic review of what was happening in the NGO world vis-a-vis -vis what did they think about the private sector. And then we talked to the private sector and then we kind of analyzed it. We came to realize, as I indicated, a certain amount of a lack of trust, but it's partly because they just don't know each other. You know, there's really no mechanism to bring the uh, private sector and NGOs together. Um, the private sector would benefit from understanding what's happening on the ground. It would help them to protect themselves. Uh, there's um, amazing data that's available within the NGO world. And the private sector could benefit from basically, uh, you know, having organizations that know how to care for people and to kind of work out their issues and problems. But this trust has to be overcome. So if any of the organizations on this call are interested in, in giving your feedback on this. Uh, what we're hoping to do is a bridging exercise to have an event where a certain number of private companies and NGOs can have a facilitated safe space to be able to talk to each other, to get to know each other, and then to use that as a basis of perhaps forging a, a linkage that hasn't really existed up until now, uh, nearly to the extent that it could uh, in terms of its full potential. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Couldn't agree more, Matt. And um please contact Matt or please contact Be Slavery Free if that's something that, that you're interested in. Uh, we work on it slightly differently, but we're, we've got the same end game. Um, Martin, anything you wanted to add into that? No, I, I don't think so. I think, um, you know, with, with yourself and with, uh, with Matt and your, organi your respective organisations, I think we've got that covered. Um, yeah. but we, I think it's a great question, by the way, and we would always urge 
um, you know, people to come together and start to, uh, um, to, to make these statements. So I, I, it's a great question. But I think you've covered off the answer for that one. Yeah, great. Okay, good. Um, okay. Well, we are almost at time and we don't have any more questions. I think this is, it must be because it's the last session. I don't think, <laughs> so people are kind of realizing, okay, we're ending. So can I say thank you, Matt? Thank you, Martin, Sam and Mindy and Liesl for being part of uh, this discussion. I, I think it's uh, generated a lot of really good dialogue. Um, really appreciate your time and your thought that has gone into this. And thank you to all of you for being part of ARAT. Uh, we did discuss in the organizing team whether we'd have a final wrap up session and we decided that probably nobody would come. So we decided that we would just do the wrap up in each of our final sessions. So we really appreciate you being part of this. To anybody who has been a speaker, a facilitator, who's asked a question, who's joined people on the Hoover app, or who's just been there and observed and been willing to learn and contribute as they can, we are incredibly grateful. And um, we will look forward to continuing to build these relationships in the work that we're doing. So thank you. And depending on where you are, good afternoon, good evening, or good morning. Thank you.